I'm excited today to be speaking with Jamie Peters with Health at Home Consultants and going to touch on a few things with our healthcare and what's changing. Jamie, thank you for being on, to, being on today. Um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about was welcoming visits from healthcare professionals. There's a lot of fear right now going on um, with any visitors coming in and out of somebody's home, especially a senior's home. Could you talk a little bit um, about what that's like when a healthcare professional visits and how to help overcome the fear and rather welcome that healthcare professional to come in? Thanks for having me too, um, first off. Second, um, I think education comes first when talking to an individual that you're seeing in the home or you're dealing with the family that comes along with that individual in the home. I feel like for both Amy and I, when as APRNs, when we're seeing somebody in the home, I think first um, visiting with the family, educating them so that that individual that you're seeing there understands that yes, it's been accepted, that we're able to come into the home. I think this probably plays a factor for you guys when you have your staff in the home setting too is education first and foremost. Yeah, absolutely. And letting, um, you're right, you know, that team that's coming in is, um, it's a separate team. They're screened, they're trained, they're professionals, they have the appropriate um, protective um, equipment that's needed, whether that's masks, gloves, you know, making sure proper hand washing, et cetera. But, but they are trained and they do have your best interests in mind. And so welcoming that um, in a proactive sense is a great thing. Yep. And I feel like every uh, home is different. For example, I had a home that I went into and she, the individual's family was there waiting and she was garbed from head to toe. She had sacks on the door handles and I ultimately opened up the door handle. I stood there, I allowed them to tell me what they wanted. Mm -hmm. um, more or less let them educate me on what their request was uh, because we all know what we should be doing as healthcare providers, but sometimes as an individual in the home, they have their own idea also. So sometimes I think it's finding what they want also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You bet. So Jamie, um, we are hearing about a lot of people of all ages deferring healthcare right now and ignoring uh, symptoms. I heard yesterday about a female in her 30s that had stroke symptoms, um, delayed going into get care for that and found out that she had COVID-19. You know, what are some of the things for people um, that would be warning signs or symptoms that you would tell them not to ignore? I feel like, again, education comes number one. Um, I really feel like for, again, our team is, I'll be honest, every night I come home and I listen to uh, the talks that are going on, any type of education that I can get on my own. Um, for example, what we should be doing every day, checking a temp, um, and, and this is healthcare. Again, you're probably speaking of a lay person that had these symptoms. I think a lay person doesn't always recognize what is a symptom? Because again, I think we're learning every day about this. I think this is a virus that we know so very little about. And so often stroke-like symptoms, you may not even recognize that being part of COVID. I think what we hear is we're looking for the temps, we're looking for the sore throats, we're looking for the cough, we're looking for what we call the standard, uh, the standard symptoms. And again, obviously, if you're having stroke-like symptoms as a 30-year-old, that should be a big red alarm that I need help for something. Would you put that connection to being COVID? Maybe not if you're a lay person, but I definitely think being keen onto your body is number one. Mm -hmm. So if a senior has some devices in their home and they're able to monitor their vitals, you know, what type of suggestions would you have for that? I feel like, uh, again, for our practice, I would like to see everybody in the home setting being on some type of telemonitoring system, whether that be through a home health care agency, through a company uh, like your guys's, or a nurse practitioner or a physician practice having a telemonitoring system. Number one, I think right now with COVID, it's your own equipment. It's not somebody else's equipment. So I think that's the big key to having your own equipment in a, in a community or in a home setting. I feel like 
you have the daily monitoring. So somebody else is looking at that, meaning the healthcare provider, the team is watching to see if there are symptoms that are inappropriate. Uh, again, I don't know how many home people and you guys would be better at answering this are actually checking their temps. I don't have a lot of that. A lot of access is probably, uh, they don't have access. They just don't have the thermometers there. So they are not checking their temps, I'll be honest. Yeah, I can understand that. You know, I, I know that there's just a portion of the population that's really good at managing their own health and there's a portion that's not. So it's maybe one of those topics of conversation when we're checking in with seniors that we care about in our own families and lives. Uh, you know, if they have underlying conditions and they're able to be monitoring themselves to ask how they're doing and, and see if we can help support them and give some advice on things that they should be watching out for themselves so they're not ignoring their own health. Right. Mm -hmm. And like you said, the teams, you know, whether that's a caregiver team or whether that's um, a healthcare professional can help them and keep them accountable um, to understand what those numbers mean. Correct. Um, and I have families often. The families are often their advocates. Um, if the family doesn't recognize that they've checked it, because uh, a lot of devices have the ability for their families to see those numbers and also you as the team that puts the equipment on. And so a lot of times it's family that is correct. So with um, what your team does, um, and it's so fantastic that you do have the model um, where you are able to get out and see people in their own uh, residence or in their own environment, um, but how have things changed for your team and for the seniors that you provide care support for? I feel like we've, uh, for us, we've maintained a busy schedule. Obviously, we've become busier in some ways than others. Uh, probably our uh, communication with families has increased because I feel like families are feeling at a loss and they're at a loss because they can't get in to see their loved one. Um, I think Carla and I have discussed this a little bit in the past of they're at a loss. They need, they need some touch, some human touch, and they don't have that, whether it be in a home or a community, they're wanting somebody to be their eyes and ears. And so often we're asked to do that. I don't know how many calls Amy and I took together this week of a family member several times, two and three calls a week by the same family member just wanting an update. Knowing that we've only been out there once that week, mm -hmm. but they're just using us as that person because we are their eyes and ears in the building. Mm -hmm. I so just Jamie, feel like it's a, go ahead. How do you think that um, right now will long-term affect healthcare? What are your thoughts on that? Definitely think we're gonna have changes in our, uh, the way that we do visits, I feel like uh, we will see more telemonitoring. I feel like we will see more distant uh, communication in some ways. But I do feel like as a human, human touch is always the most, uh, I mean, it, it, there's something so special about human touch. I feel like our elderly population is definitely in need of that human touch. Uh, it's really saddening when we go into a home or into a facility where you ask them, how have you been? And the first thing they say is lonely. You may hear that on, a, on this population anytime, but I feel like it's really escalated over the last three to four weeks, which is to be, obviously, we all know um, that part will change. I do feel like there will be lots of new, um, I mean, for example, did you ever say you have Zoom prior to four weeks ago? I hadn't. So I, I feel like there will be lots of fun changes. So yeah, I'm hoping that families can connect, continue to connect that mm -hmm. way in the future if they haven't. You know, distance for a senior is really difficult. Uh, our team tries to help out with that in the past, but um, definitely more widely accepted now to help people connect with their grandkids and their kids. That's pretty cool. Oh, it's huge and you guys probably witness that much more than I do because a lot of my population 
dementia comes into play. And so you guys don't have maybe as many demented individuals that you care for. So I feel like it could really be beneficial for family connection. I really do. I feel like with dementia individuals, it's sometimes difficult to communicate because they have that hard uh, connection with a screen and touch and they don't understand that. But in the population that does not have that disease, oh, wow, awesome. I mean, I think in the last couple of weeks here, um, we, we've definitely seen, um, like you said, changes in how we connect with people. And um, it's very interesting and will be uh, continue um, to be very interesting to see how um, someone's mental health um, is affected. Um, would you tell us a little bit, I know you brought on a new team member and Amanda's role and how you're looking at holistic wellness with adding her to your team? Yes, very excited. Uh, I have Amanda Millamon. She's a PA that I work with. Uh, she's a psychiatric uh, physician's assistant. Uh, the exciting news with her is we had several of our individuals that we see um, as a primary role. Uh, Amy and I have been able to take care of the primary role and their chronic conditions, but the one piece that I felt like we were missing on our end was, again, that psychiatric side, that mental health. Mm -hmm. And I feel like we've been able to utilize my nurse, Jan, to work alongside with Amanda and come into that home setting and see those individuals and work on that mental health, uh, set, up, set up maybe a mental health provider or a psychologist to come in and just visit with these individuals, um, prescribe the medications that are needed, set up with, maybe it's a neuropsychologist, maybe it's something past what Health at Home can do, and they need a neuropsychologist to be involved to give more of a diagnosis to why we're having behaviors or increased confusion or depression, especially during this time, depression and anxiety. Yeah. Have, you seen, have you seen a lot of that uptick in their last three, four weeks? What's that look yes. like? Yes. Oh, um, I would say it's probably, I would say probably twofold in some of our communities. Uh, home individuals, I feel like I have not seen it as much. But I don't know if there is, is as much change in a home environment versus a community environment. In a community environment, we've not only taken our people out of our um, cafeteria or dietary area, we no longer are having activities that involve an entire group. They may be doing some group activities, but it's more or less from your room. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel as if, yeah, the depression is much worse. Anxiety, I would say, is heightened also. Mm -hmm. Even every room, not every, I would say most rooms I walk into, if there is a TV on, our elderly population loves CNN or they love news channels. And so often we don't walk into gun smoke playing. We walk into a CNN and we all know what is on CNN right now. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of talk of the COVID. And so they are having a hard time comprehending how long is this going to happen? Is this going to be until I die? Um, is my family okay? Do they have it? They just have so many unanswered questions. As yeah, I do. think that our um, caregivers have, um, have seen that and have been um, really playing a big role in exactly that, encouraging people, you know, when they are in, um, in the homes or in a residence um, to turn off the TV and you know, to create or maybe continue some home exercise programs because we're seeing a lot of lack of movement. Um, so we need to keep people moving to keep their immune system boosted, you know, and sometimes people are scared to walk outside. So it's great mm -hmm. to have somebody maybe um, to walk with or, yep. you know, allowing somebody to help um, get you the healthy foods or fresh foods so you're not microwaving TV dinners for everything. Um, and continue the, the hobbies that do make you happy. And whether that's um, music, I'm a huge fan of music. Um, it's hard for our, our choir not to be out singing right now, but whether that's music or gardening, I'm um, not starting outside too soon here. We just got this snow. But I know, okay. Yeah, um, you know, we've had some caregivers that have been doing, uh, while they're there visiting with their family, they've been um, FaceTiming uh, with grandchildren or that sort of thing, people who know that they're at home. And so 
um, helping in positive ways, like you said, um, for that mental health aspect. So not only to make sure somebody is healthy in regards to their vitals and their everyday life, but also their, their mental and emotional health as well. Yeah, I think those are all top-notch ideas. I do the same thing when I walk into an individual's room. I try to shut the TV off and try to find other things for them to do. I think that's best said. One of the things that I think about right now, you know, oftentimes when we start to help provide support to a family, um, the senior that we serve might not be as excited about it because they have a feeling of now we have to have a nurse come in and help us with our everyday tasks. So you know, really what Carla and I have done with our team is what would you like to do today? That's really our motto with our clients because we're used to, even with my own family, you know, it's easy to dwell on something that you're not able to do anymore. You can dwell on that when there's hundreds of things that we can still do. And so now's really a great time for, for our team to continue to push that because they're talking about, you know, when we probably half of our clients that we support live in communities. That would be really difficult to be in your apartment and know that there are hundreds of people around you and you're really used to human connection, um, but you just can't have that when you're staying inside. To see how we can focus as you're talking about turning off TV and just doing some different activities. Um, mm -hmm. I, I pose that to our team and say, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of work to say, how can we be engaged and uh, bring joy to the visits, but just being willing to say, so I think this is even us as individuals when we're working with people that we love, um, you know, that it is difficult right now, but if there was one thing that we could do today to have a great day, what would that look like? Uh, that helps us just to get feedback from that person of, they're going to tell me the one thing that will make a difference and then we can go out and do that. We don't have to try so many things to try and figure out if that's going to be their key for that day. And sometimes, you know, it might be my husband and I used to get Dickie's barbecue every week and we haven't been able to go there for months. And so then we figure right. out, you know, what are the ways that we can get that delivered and yes. do something fun and cool because when we focus on the things that we can't do versus the things that we can do, that can change days quite a bit. Completely agree. I love that story of the Dickies barbecue because I've heard that myself is my son used to do this. Mm. I used to get this and I think recalling or remembering as a family member. Oh, I can still go to Dickies barbecue. I can pick it up and drop it off. I feel like we forget that. We, we forget that as that younger generation that we can still do those things. Another example, I had a little lady lives at one of the legacy properties and she said, my son showed up and she lives on a second floor window, but he, how the window works, he can walk right up to the window and his basically here up, she can mm -hmm. see him and he surprised her. And that has been her, the way that she survives every day. She said she waits for him to show up at the window and all it is is a knock. He doesn't tell her he's coming. He knocks and then she goes to that window and she just cries when she tells the story. Got I it. love it. Yeah. Well, Jamie, thank you so much to you and your team for all that you do. Um, we at uh, Home Care Partners of Nebraska appreciate collaborating with you and being a partner with you. Um, if somebody is at home and they are seeing some red flags or they have some concerns, what's the best way for them to get a hold of you? I feel like most of our communities know how to get in contact with us. They have our phone number. They have my nurse, Jan, and um, to reach out to her. They have my cell phone number. They have our office number. It's 402-440-5268. And I will definitely think, you, think of you guys when I'm in communities or in the home also. Thank you so much, Jamie. Have a great rest of your day. And thank you to all of your team. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Have a